Hello guys, I'm Lance Wheeler, the creator of the Core Velocity Belt, and inside this video I'm going to walk you through the new Core Velocity Belt 5.0 training system and why I created it. Now here's what we're going to cover. Why the arm is a terrible thing to waste. Why I believe 99% of mechanical issues are man-made. Three reasons why arm injuries have nothing to do with the arm and the alarming discovery I made about the Core Velocity Belt and why it's not really a pitching or a hitting tool. Now, each year I host Pitchapalooza. Pitchapalooza is a baseball conference that I host in December. Started this about five years ago, and it's quickly grown to become one of the largest in the country. This past year it was attended by well over 400 coaches, uh, all the way from Major League Baseball to Youth Baseball. And during my research for the 5.0 training system, I started looking over the past videos, and one that really jumped out at me was the one with Jeff Passan. Jeff is the lead columnist for ESPN Baseball, and he's also the best-selling author of The Arm. In your research, what did you find, was, if you had to just say two, what would be the two indicators or potentials for higher risk of injury with the pitchers? I wish I understood movement better because I think that is a huge part of it, and I think that we're beginning to get there. I think technology is going to help out a lot with teaching the right movement patterns. But at the same time, I heard you talking outside a little bit earlier about you doing what comes naturally to you and allowing a person to, to find whether it's his own arm slot, whether it's his release point, whatever it may be. And as a coach, I don't want to mess with somebody who who feels a particular way. What, what's, what's, your, what's your slogan? Trust what you feel. Trust what you feel. And, and I think there is a lot to be said for that. I think usage matters. But I think for the average kid, especially the younger ones who are growing into their bodies and who are trying to understand uh, where their arms are and to develop proprioception and to, to figure out how to actually throw a baseball the right way, I think that burdening them with excessive usage is the absolute worst thing you can do. All right, as you heard Jeff say, two reasons or two things that he would like to have known more about. Number one was the movement aspect, but number two was the reason why he felt so many players got hurt was because of overuse, and we're going to talk about both of those. But first, I just want to drop a few alarming stats on you. Did you realize that arm injuries have increased over 250% in the past 10 years, and that includes a 27 drop in player participation, excuse me, participation. In other words, there are less players and more injuries. But here's the problem is that most guys think it's the arm when a recent study showed approximately 58% of players on the disabled list tested for deficiency in the hip. So what those numbers are telling you is that one in every four Major League Baseball pitchers are sliced open and they're set for a 10 to 14 month rehab period. And when we talk about the UCL, the Tommy John injuries, we're looking at an epidemic rise in injuries with it increasing over 193% inside a 10-year period. But the real question, like Jeff wanted to know, is why? Why is this happening? There's all kinds of theories out there. I'm going to get to mine in a second. But let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's look at this in the top left on UCL construction reconstruction surgeries. This dates back to 1995 and the last was in 2010. Now these are youth in high school. You can see how it started to climb and a big reason is like Jeff said it's the chase for velocity. Now on the right is something very interesting. We just mentioned this earlier. Uh, inside this article we found that over 58 percent of arm injuries uh, can be traced back to deficits in the hip. So what that's telling you is that most of the arm injuries we're seeing or experiencing have nothing to do with the arm. It's somewhere else found in the body, and most often it's going to be in the driver of all movement. That's going to be the hips. Now on the bottom left, this is the summary of velocity principles, and it shows how energy is transferred up the chain, and any sort of inefficient movement, poor mechanics, whatever you want to call it, is going to break this. So um, how it all starts, it shows at the leg, but really a question I'd like to ask you is, if we're going to talk ground force and how energy starts at the ground, is it possible 
for me to stand still, or you try standing up right now and putting force into the ground without making a movement from the hips. It's not. So that can be a little bit misleading. But anyway, the purpose of the summary of velocity principle is just to show how that each link in the chain is to turn, stop, and it, and it continues to pass energy up the chain. Now here's something really interesting by Dr. Kibler. And that is a 20% loss of energy by the trunk and hips would require a 34% increase in shoulder internal rotation velocity to create a similar force on the throwing hand and ball. So now you've got a little bit clearer idea of what we were just talking about with so many arm injuries when that it's not really the arm, it's something else in the body that's breaking down. But the question is, how can we fix that? That's the million dollar answer that everybody's searching for. Now, here's another guy that I really, really respect, and I actually respect him so much that I spelled his name wrong. Must be spell check. Uh, this is Mike Reinold, and Mike Reinold, um, he was a trainer for the Boston Red Sox. He's now with another Major League Baseball organization, but a brilliant guy, and you're really going to like what he says inside his Pitchapalooza presentation back in 2017. But when we think about this concept and we think about what training is now, training can't be focused on velocity throwing programs. There's more ways to skin a cat and there's more things we can do to enhance velocity than simply throwing. But everybody in the world now wants to sell you their max velocity program, right? You look on the internet now, pretty much Google this, you'll have dozens and dozens and dozens of programs that you can buy. Everybody has this shiny new toy, okay? So we have this ability now to start this velocity program. It's so sexy, right? Such a cool name to say, this max velocity program. But the problem is, is these velocity programs are likely stressing the arm all year round. So we can't have our performance enhancement programs focused solely on throwing. There are several ways we can enhance velocity. If that's the key factor that you've decided to focus on for your organization as velocity, there's several ways to do it, but there's better ways than others. And you have to put that all together. Remember, popular does not mean best. There are safe ways that we can enhance this velocity and reduce injuries at the same time. And the way I like to phrase it, the way I like to do it with my athletes, is I say, this is your bucket of water. Your full potential is by filling this bucket up as much as we can. You know how the pros do it? You know what they did? I break it into four categories usually. One is age and maturity, because without that, what's really the point? Right? A 12-year-old kid wants to throw as hard as he can and start a velocity program, but he doesn't have that age of maturity. Right? The second one, though, is good mechanics and throwing programs. Velocity programs are important. Throwing programs that we can perform to enhance velocity are important, but you can see it's a small portion of this bucket. And then, of course, strength and conditioning and arm care programs. Those are my four buckets we have to maximize. What does the amateur player look like? And this is high school collegiate even, right? You think we give, sometimes we give some of these college guys too much credit, but they're way more deconditioned than we think. Well, they look like this. They haven't really maximized any of their buckets yet, right? But they want to increase their velocity now. So what do they do? They Google it, they get on a velocity throwing program, and they overload that one portion of the bucket by doing the one thing that isn't good for you over and over again. Does that make sense? So the thing we need to do, especially at the youth level, or somebody that doesn't have full age and maturity, is to maximize our other buckets, right? If we're going straight to a throwing program that's focused on velocity, it's what I essentially call focusing on the frosting before we've baked our cake. We don't want to focus on that stuff until you've laid an appropriate foundation. And I think that's what we're missing right now in the game of baseball. We haven't laid a foundation. You haven't maximized your other buckets before we start working on the things that are overstressing our body. All right, now we're getting to this. You saw or you heard what Mike discussed with, with all the issues um, on how we're chasing velocity. We're not really putting those into buckets. But to me, that's not just the only problem. A big problem today is what I call man-made mechanics. It's almost like the Frankenstein theory. We've got so many guys out there that are experts. You don't believe me, go on Facebook, go on Twitter, wherever you want to go. But the problem with what I'm seeing with today's culture is we're obsessed by pitching mechanics. Uh, it's almost as like we're trying to put Frankenstein together and we're piecing him piece by piece by piece. We're taking away from the player's individuality, from his strengths and from his weaknesses. And we're really building a pitcher based on what our views are as pleasing and to me it's devastating it's why you see so many issues and let's go a little bit deeper into that 
First thing is I refer to these kids, bless their hearts, as pitching mechanics. It's, it's crazy how we view it today, but if I miss high, we blame it on pitching mechanics. If my arm hurts, we blame it on pitching mechanics. If my velocity is down, we blame it on pitching mechanics. Anything and everything relates back to pitching me mechanics. And so what you're getting is that kids are constantly thinking about pitching mechanics. They start to overthink it. They lose confidence in any form of movement. Anytime I'm conscious of having to move, I just can't be very efficient. So if we're going to talk pitching lessons and and think that pitching mechanics and lessons are the answers, then we're going to continue to have problems. Um, but when I think about uh, the man-made problems, number one, it starts with pitching drills. Honestly, there is not a movement flaw you could ever hope to correct with pitching mechanics, but that's what we do is that so many kids are moving poorly and they're hoping to resolve that issue with a pitching drill when the truth is, uh, poor movement quality when used with pitching drills, it's only going to screw mechanics. Now, the second part is emulation. It's the idea that, hey, if I look like that guy, he throws 95. So if I do what he does, I will throw 95. Couldn't be further from the truth. And then finally, it's the idea that we focus on the mechanics and not the movements. And honestly, guys, that's the real killer. So let's talk about pitching drills for, for a moment. First off, I just want to let you know, most of you guys, you don't have a mechanical problem. You've got a movement problem. And like I said earlier, there's no pitching drill that will resolve a movement issue. And the more that we spend time with drills, the more emphasis we place on drills and mechanics, we're forcing these pitchers to overthink. And whenever guys start to overthink, it leads to poor performance and inefficient movement. Uh, and then you see it. You see it all the time. The next thing you know, the guy's questioning himself. He's wondering why he's not having success. All the pitchers you're showing him that do what you're asking him to do, they have success, so it must be him. He must be unathletic. He must be uh, uncoachable. But this all comes back to our thought process on pitching mechanics and pitching drills. Now, the second thing is emulation. Uh, and this was a quote that I absolutely love. This is Butch Thompson. He's a head coach at Auburn U University. This is the original pitch of Palooza when he was the pitching coach in Mississippi State. And this jumped out at me. He says, I'm 46 years old and I can't sign my name the same way twice. What makes me think I could sign yours if you can't? But what do you think we're doing with emulation? Just think about the power of that statement. How many times have you signed your name? It requires one body part. There's no stress. There's nobody on base. There's no hitter up. You're not losing a job. It's something you've done thousands and thousands of times. It requires one hand, and you can't do it twice. But yet, we're asking 14, 15-year-old kids to look at Araldus Chapman and imitate what he does when we can't even sign our name the same way twice. And you think about how many movements using the entire body and it occurring under one second, but yet we're asking guys to do what they do. So this video is, is really cool. <laughs> Dr. Glenn Fly, sick at ASMI clinic, when I was a co uh, pitching coach at Birmingham Southern, used to take my pitching staff over there. They've been hooking guys up to motion analysis for over 20 years. I called him in advance of going to speak in Chicago in January, and I said, Dr. Fleissig, has anybody from Nolan Ryan down to the eight-year-olds that they work in that they pay to come have that motion analysis done, has anybody ever repeated the same delivery twice, ever? No. When we get into the emulation, and this is what I'm talking about with the Frankenstein model. And it really all started with Tim Linscomb. It's the idea that, hey, these guys can do it. Let's take a little bit from uh, Tim Linscomb. Let's take a little bit from Araldus Chapman, uh, Clayton Kershaw, you name it. So the next thing you know is we're saying, well, look at his back leg. Let's do what his back leg does. So I'll take an Araldus Chapman back leg. I'll take a Tim Linscomb front leg. I'll take a... Uh, a Clayton Kershaw high glove side, high arm slot. And then the next thing you know, after all the time we've spent practicing this over and over and over, what's the movement pattern look like? Well, you got it. It's Frankenstein. We've just pieced it together. We've screwed pitching drills in where we think they go. And then we've get a stiff, rigid mover who can't move. It's the Frankenstein theory, but that's what we're doing, guys, and we really got to start to think twice about what's going on in the pitching world, and like my good friend Scott Lando, I love this comment because we get guys all the time asking about drills, and so what happens is they jump from coach to coach, drill to drill, and when it's not working, what do most people do? 
Well, they come to you wanting more drills. So Scott's question is, if everything in the past has been working, why isn't it working? And that's, that's what we're doing over and over and over. So, but the real problem to me is the idea uh, that we focus on the what. We're looking, it's almost as if we're standing on the side of a lake or a pond and we're focused on the ripples. We're trying to put sandbags up to keep the ripples from uh, flooding onto the shore, when in reality we need to look across the pond and find out what's causing the ripples. Why are the ripples there? So instead of putting sandbags up to protect the uh, ripples from hitting the shore, we need to look across and, and maybe remove the rocks from the other side that are being thrown in because nobody ever addresses why are the ripples occurring. Instead, we look at the, the ripple furthest from the actual cause and that's what we address. And again, it just goes back to pitching mechanics that we focus on the mechanics, we focus on the what, we never focus on the why which is the actual movements occurring or the breakdown of movements. So something that really over the past 14 months and just hours and hours of research, reading everything I can. In fact, I've got over 149 whiteboards of information. Now you gotta realize these whiteboards are six feet wide and they're four feet in height. And they're pasted on the wall similar to, to window tent. And so as I started to dig into the research, there were three common reasons why I kept coming back to arm injuries and why they have nothing to do with the arm. And the first is just a low movement IQ. Today's culture of kids, they simply don't move. They don't play outside. It's the phone. Call it whatever you want, but players aren't moving very well. The second part is poor pelvic stability. And what I mean by that, it's just stable hips. Just imagine trying to stay dry when tossing a cannonball from a canoe. Good luck, right? So you take poor movers with poor stability, you put them into lessons where we're causing them over to think, we're confusing them, we're getting a generation of players that are moving worse, they're specializing, playing all year, and now they're moving more often. And that's, that's a killer, and that's why we're seeing so many arm injuries in my opinion. Now, here's Kyle Body. Kyle is a guy I, I've known for a long time. I really respect his work. He's at the forefront of pitching. He's revolutionized a lot of con uh, concepts as far as throwing and with weighted balls. And so when you think of Kyle, you think, well, he's only stressing weighted balls and arm strength. But no, that's, that's not the key at all. Kyle really understands pitching and what it takes to develop players. So I think that you're going to be a little bit surprised when you hear what Kyle has to say here. Alone is nothing. Right, so people that sell throwing programs, like this is a throwing program, this is alone what you need, um, this is, it is fine, it's something you need for sure. And if you're a college kid, you should absolutely audit the colleges and the pro teams in the draft too, about what your throwing program is. It's important, absolutely. Um, but it by itself is absolutely nothing. And uh, training programs should essentially be centered around strength and movement quality first, and then progress plyometrically. Note that I said plyometrically, and not necessarily anything to do with throwing, because throwing a baseball or throwing any object is plyometric in nature. So just like you shouldn't have seven-year-olds going to soccer agility camps doing ladders and box jumps and cone drills, which by the way is literally one of the worst things you can do for a kid, you know, you wouldn't have seven-year-olds doing weighted ball throwing or even the heck of a lot of throwing at all. I agree with Jeff in that his kids shouldn't be doing any sort of throwing program outside of playing catch in the frozen tundras of Kansas or wherever the hell he lives. And, you know, like that would probably be the best case scenario um, entirely. A little surprise, right? But here's the thing, and you, you saw that, that Kyle mentioned quality movement is where we should start. And on the left, we've got Araldis, our guy, Araldis Chapman again. And we've got all these guys that are coming in and – and they're wanting better mechanics because they think better mechanics, I'll throw harder. Again, we blame everything on mechanics. But the truth is, is that most of the players that come into my three-day pitching program, they can't even perform the most basic movement, and that being the hinge. So think about with the hinge. If I can't perform a hinge, why would I be able to perform anything else because it's with the hands that I'm really starting to move through the middle of my body. I'm able to activate the glutes and start to disassociate the spine, but most can't do that. But here's the real crazy thing when you when you really think about it is that is that one thing we hear stressed all the time is hip shoulder separation. We need more hip shoulder separation. We need more hip shoulder separation. Yet most players can't separate their hips from their shoulders while sitting on two knees or standing 
but they're looking for drills to try to separate their hips from their shoulders while moving down a mound, throwing to a hitter, trying to throw it to a spot with runners on base. So if I can't do this standing still, what makes us think that we could do this while moving? What makes us think there's any drill out there that would help us do that? But that's kind of where we are today in our thinking and our approach to pitching. But in reality, when it comes to pitching mechanics, pitching mechanics are a series of synchronized motions built of basic movements you can feel. So if we were to start backwards, first of all, I've got to be able to feel the movement. Once I'm able to feel the movement, I'm going to start to coordinate just the basic movements. Once I feel comfortable coordinating and consistently repeating the basement basic movements, now I'm going to start to synchronize those into motion. And once I've completed the motions, well, those are the pitching mechanics. The pitching mechanics are really just the what of everything. That's the end product. But it all starts with your brain because until you can actually feel it, it's going to be hard to move it. Unless you can move it, you can never really synchronize it into motion, yet we start with pitching mechanics. So here's the three reasons why so many players are getting hurt and it has nothing to do with the arm. As, uh, as we've already talked about, number one is a low movement IQ. Players simply can't feel their hips. We call that proprioception. So think about this. If you were a piano player and I said, all right, I want you to play the piano, but your hand had fallen asleep, how good would that sound? Obviously, you wouldn't be Liberace, right? So what you need to know is that poor proprioception leads to zero coordination. Without proprioception or awareness, there is no way that I can coordinate a movement, and that's where we're at with most players, especially regarding the hips. Because poor hip awareness uh, leads to poor coordination, and obviously, if I'm not very coordinated, I don't have much awareness, then I'm not going to be very mobile or flexible in that area because I'm just not going to use it correctly. So that those are all indicators that lead to uh, higher stress on the arm because what most people fail to realize is we start with the body not the brain and it's the brain that controls every single move you make it's almost like a puppet a puppet and what you have to realize is that the muscles are a puppet to the nervous system they control every single move that you make and if you're not aware of where your strings are on your puppet or your body there's just no way you could ever hope to coordinate those movements now, here's Dr. Seals, another Pitchapalooza video. Now, Dr. Seals is the director of neurosurgery at Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And he was also the first ever named chief medical officer by Roger Godell uh, in the NFL. And here's what Dr. Seals has to say in explaining hip proprioception and pelvic stability and why it's so important. And I do think this has something to do with the core velocity belt. And here's why. Uh, I think it's about, there's actually some pretty good research out about this that's just starting to come out. One of the things we know is that women soccer players, basketball players, have a lot more ACL injuries than men do, right? And everybody said, why is that? Why should women tear their ACL? The ligament's not any less strong, per se. Why does that happen? Well, the research that's coming out says it turns out that female athletes have a lot less proprioceptive awareness in their hips. And the idea is with a complex movement, when they land, they don't have proprioceptive awareness. They put excess uh, 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 unmitigated force on the knee, and therefore they're more likely to tear their ACL. So a lot of times we just think of this as bad balance. Oh, he's got bad balance. Well, it's really not balance, okay? The cerebellum, the inner ear, they're working okay. It's poor hip proprioceptive awareness and kinesthetic awareness. And a lot of players are weak, right? They're just very weak in these muscles. They're pelvic and hip stabilizer muscles. Your glutes are really important. I've read one guy who says your butt's your key to your life. When uh, you know, Take that however you want. But it's like you've got to have strong gluteal muscles because if you're strong in your glutes, then you can start to stabilize your pelvis, start to stabilize your hips, and you're going to be better at transferring force out of the ground. Does that matter in baseball? You bet. Where do we gather velocity for pitching? Where do we gather velocity for hitting? Where do we generate the power? It's transferring it from the ground through the hips. So if the hips are leaking this out and they can't stabilize and transfer, we're not going to be very effective. I told you, good stuff. That's one of the brightest men that I've ever met. He's just got a way of explaining things in a way that's very simple to understand. All right, now reason number two is lack of pelvic stability. Like I mentioned earlier, that would be similar to trying to stay dry while tossing a cannonball 
from a canoe. Good luck with that, right? Now with pelvic stability and with a core velocity belt, our main focus is not the waist. And I see that all the time. Guys are actually wasting their time because they don't place it in the right position. They place it around the waist versus the hips, and those are two. Those are as different as the nose and the quad. I mean, they're just two separate body parts. It's the hips and the glutes that are responsible for rotation. But most players, because they have poor stability, they leak energy at the hips. And I've always said the quickest way to increase your velocity is to by sealing the leaks, causing you to lose velocity. But any time that we're leaking energy at the hips, well, there's going to be a compensation occur, and there's going to be another body part up the chain closer to the arm that's going to take on the added stress to try to, to, to generate the velocity or the energy that was being lost at the hips. So this was something really cool in my uh, research. It was a study that I found on lumbopelvic stability, um, and I'll give you the link to that. But some of the key notes inside this study were, were the, uh, the amount of days missed due to injury in professional baseball. And what they found, due to the fact that pitching is a whole body motion requiring the coordination and control of all segments and joints, body awareness, uh, coaches alike have theorized that deficiencies in the neuromuscular control of the lower extremities, pelvis, and trunk may contribute to elbow and shoulder injuries. We've already really discussed a lot of the, in the, uh, the research behind that. But inside this test, what they were doing, if you look to the right, there's a player. He's simply just performing a single leg lift, and he's trying to keep his waist, his hips, as level as possible. But what they found was pitchers with better lumbo-pelvic control pitched significantly more innings and had lower walks plus hits per inning pitch than those with poor control. Just think that my body, every move I make is controlled by the hips. So if my hips are shifting or moving, well, that's the direction my body's going to move. So therefore, it could affect command, control, added stress to the arm. Now, pitchers, the number of days missed in those with poor control were significantly greater than the moderate or good groups, which is consistent with an increased number of injuries or increased severity of injuries in the poor control group. So obviously if you have poor control stability of the hips, you're going to have added stress to the arm. You're not going to be able to pitch as much or pitch as nearly as high level performance as you could with stable hips. Now improving lumbo pelvic strength, endurance and control have been reported to lower the occurrence of lower extremity injuries and improve or improve lower extremity biomechanics in numerous sporting situations. Well, there you go. If I can control the hips, they're more stable, suddenly I have better mechanics. And these results suggest that a similar result may happen in baseball pitching. And we've seen this from our side over and over. So let's make sense of all this. Imagine, let's visualize the human body as a hose and we're trying to water the field. Now, the hose that I have isn't long enough to make it to the field, so I have to connect an, another hose. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the hose to the faucet. Now, that connector there would represent foot stability, ground stability, and the actual green hose would be mobility. So let's just say that I wasn't connected uh, to the faucet, obviously it's going to leak at the ground. Now, imagine if I had a knot in the water hose. There's not going to be much water leaking up. That would be my mobility. Now the second part of this, we're going to connect hose to hose as you see in the top right. That right there would be pelvic stability. If there's leaking there, then obviously the pressure at the other end, hence velocity, uh, isn't going to be, the force isn't going to be as great. So I'd have to really tighten that well. Now the end result is going to be the water or the force or pressure of the water coming out at the other end. If everything is connected, everything's stable, there's no knots in the hose, then of course I'm going to get the field watered. If not, it's going to take me longer to do, to do uh, the same amount of work. So it's just the efficiency and the stress that, that's involved with all that. Now, why we keep stressing the hips? Most people, when they think of the lower body, they think, oh, I've just got to use my legs. But you could be the best ever at using your legs, getting as much ground force as possible. But if you can't transfer that up through the hips to the upper body, there's the legs are useless. Because I always look at the hips as the other half, almost as if they're a fuse box. And so if I were connecting uh, fuses from one power source to the next, if that box blew, well, then I'm not ever going to transfer energy to the, to the end of the chain. So what you've got to look at when it comes to the hips is they control every move you make, and you're only as efficient as your weakest link because the hips control direction, rotation, connection from lower body to upper body, acceleration, deceleration. In fact, 
Whenever we're walking, the first we move we make is with the hips followed by the feet. So it's the hips to where everything starts. That's our center of gravity. And it's the players that can really control the hips, it, which separates your 85 from your 95 guys. And, and another reason for this is that the more efficient that I can move through my hips, the faster that I can move, well, then I start to give my arm no choice but to move faster because it, you're giving, you're convincing it that it's running out of time. And that's what we would like to refer to as peer pressure. And it's also why we're constantly stressing that arm speed is instant, arm strength is not. So take, for example, so many guys out there that can perform the running gun. They can throw the ball 90 miles per hour, but as soon as they step on the mound, they lose it. Why is that? Well, because in the outfield, they're able to create momentum by using the legs uh, with a running start, and then they can throw. But from a standstill position, they simply do not have the w awareness or control of the hips to generate the same result with arm speed. So the hips is where we spend all of our attention because the more that you can spend time, the more efficient that you become moving through the center of your body, the more efficient the rest of the moving parts are going to become. Now, reason number three, we've talked about the other two, and my final answer for this uh, is because players lack hip proprioception, they don't have a feel for the hips, because they lack pelvic stability, they don't move very well. Then we put these players uh, in drills, in games that aren't moving very well, and you've created an entire generation of players that are moving worse more often. Now, on top of that, they're also chasing velocity with these poor movement patterns. And then we're playing God with all the man-made pitching mechanics. We're focusing on the ripples versus the rock that's being thrown in. And we've created a player that's forced to overthink. He's overusing what's underprepared, and I think Warren Buffett would call that the compounding effect. So, the reason that so many players are getting hurt is because they don't move very well. And so now we're going into the three reasons why I created the 5.0 velocity program. Now, those that move the best throw the hardest, Dr. Seals. Now, this is a really cool video from last year at Pitchapalooza. And uh, what he found was that those that throw the hardest were the ones that move the best. And it's the same that we've seen in our research as well. Now, as I said, what this has typically been done for is to predict injury risk. And there's some literature I'll show you about that. So we did it at the start of, of this offseason with this team I'm coaching this year. They're 17 year olds, pretty elite team, some of the best high school players in the area. And we, we did that as part of a panel of sort of offseason baseline testing. We brought them all in and we tested broad jump and, and we tested 60 yard dash time. And we measured exit velos. We measured throwing velocities and we did this. We did a number of parameters. And as I was going back and look at the data, I was incredibly struck by this um, graph of the data, or when I put it out graphically. So down here on the x-axis is velocity, okay? That shows how hard the kids were throwing. On the y-axis is their functional movement screen score. And what do you notice? Our three hardest throwing kids were also the three that scored the highest on the functional movement screen. The kids that threw the slowest were some of the lower uh, scores on the functional movement screen. And it wasn't just size, right? So this, this, this end dot down here, um, this dot down here, I mean, this kid's kind of a freak. He weighs probably 180 pounds, you say, coach, but I mean, he's just got an incredibly fast arm. He, he's, he's a freak. This kid right here is about 150 pounds with rocks in his pockets, okay? So he's not just humping up and throwing it because of power but I think it's because he's incredibly efficient with transferring force. Second, those that move the best stress the least. And what I mean by that is not only from uh, an arm stress standpoint, obviously if I move better through the center, I'm going to move more efficiently with the arm, but also by moving better, I don't have to think about it because if I had to think about it, I wouldn't be moving efficiently. So these players, they they – experience far less mental stress because they're not having to overthink everything. They can actually feel it and start to become their own coach. And really at the end of the day, that's what it's about when you're on the mound is being able to self-adjust and self-correct. And that all starts inside your training. Now, finally, those that move the best, who stress the least mentally, physically, emotionally, and throw the hardest are the ones that feel invincible. And really that's my goal for you. When I created the, the core velocity belt, Originally, I thought it was an overspeed device. It was going to do this. It was going to do that. But after having this thing for almost, well, working on it for close to 12 years now, and, and the time and the, the research, what I found is that it's not really a, a pitching tool. It's not a hitting tool. 
It's a movement tool. And by becoming more aware of the center of your body, the more efficient that you start to move, the better you feel, the higher levels of performance, and the less stress that you're experiencing. Because you're not overthinking or overanalyzing every single move. You can feel it so you can repeat it. And that's why I'm always stressing. We teach movements you can feel and not mechanics you can't. And just the proof is in the pudding with the core velocity belt. Over the past five College World Series, three of the past winners have won the national championship. Now, does it have anything to do with the core velocity belt? No, 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 no. Not saying that at all. I'm just saying the coaches that are using the belt at this level right here, they just really understand development and they understand the importance of moving. And that's why I created the core velocity belt 5.0 training system.